My dear brothers and sisters, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, but in the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works or dead. is dead. Good morning, church. Good job. If you're with us online, we're really glad that you're here too. Good morning to you. I trust that you just said it back. It's good stuff. Uh, have you ever been in a moment, maybe some of you got to go back uh, in your mind's archives to really get here, but take, take yourself back to school, all right? And you're sitting in class and your teacher or professor or whatever gives you a test. And you sit there and you look at that test and you have no clue. You ever been there? So uh, I was sitting in my Koine Greek class at CCU. It was a part of my master's program. And that moment was right there. Like, that's how I felt. I had no clue. But let me give you a little bit of backstory. Because leading up to this moment um, was a lot. So I, when we went to Cincinnati and started studying in Bible college, uh, I ended up finishing my bachelor's degree in the adult learning program. So that meant I was uh, working full-time at a bank, working part-time at the church, and there's really part-time ministry doesn't exist. Um, and then I was going to school full-time at the same time. And so uh, because we had Kyrea on the way, and she ended up coming, and then we were doing that. And so I got the bachelor's degree done and then started my master's program. And by then I was working full-time at the church and doing going to school full-time for a master's level uh, degree program. And so life was full. And then Piper came along and it was just a lot. And I had just realized going up to that moment, uh, I was starting to hit an emotional wall. Now, at that point, like Greek, I had had three or four semesters of, of Greek class but Greek is just something like, there's a reason we say it's all Greek to me, you know? Like, there's a reason for that. And I wasn't, like, spending enough time studying, like, memorizing. And we were in advanced level Greek, so we were just translating passages straight from the, the New Testament text. And my, my brain, I was, just wasn't there. I didn't have enough energy to give. And so I'm sitting here. In this class, and I'm looking at this passage, I'm supposed to translate from Greek to English, and then I have to translate from, because my professor, he's a good dude, he's Australian, but he's awesome, but he's just not nice. Um, so I had to translate, I had to translate English to Greek, and that's just throwing me for a loop. There's too many wires crossing, I had to answer questions about the different passages and why we did the thing, and what are the, you know, parse it out and all that stuff. And my just, my brain wasn't there. And I, I really don't like being in those moments because I like knowing the answer. I, I like knowing the answer to tests. Have you ever been there? <laughs> so in life, um, if life is a test, sometimes knowing the right answer isn't enough. Sometimes we can know the right answer and still make the wrong choice. You ever been there? Um, sometimes there are people that we experience in the church and some of you have dealt with church hurt because of these people who know the Bible a lot and yet don't seem to be changed by Jesus even a little. And so James is going to be talking about that kind of dynamic. Like, what does it look like to actually have faith in Jesus? What does it look like to really follow him? What does it look like to be a Christian? And in this passage, y'all, like, there's no moments where I can be like, like, make it fun Really, like, he's just like, James, like, I like him, but, cause I, I feel like we have some, some commonalities in our personality, but like, he's not given me any moments of like, comedic relief in this passage, okay? So just understand that, like, he's real straightforward, I'm gonna have to be real straightforward, but I'll try and make it to where we can all have moments where we can breathe, okay? But just understand what James is getting at, um, is really important. James chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. James chapter 2, and we are in verse 14. This is what he says. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Hey, 
Go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed. But you don't give them what the body needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. So James uh, bookends this passage with the same kind of idea. Faith without works, what good is it? Faith without works is dead by itself. Um, James is really getting after the question, and this is something if you grew up in church and you've been in church for a little bit, uh, you've heard the word faith, right? Like you've heard that word. And if, even if you're not in church, you have some kind of concept of what faith is. And a lot of times we think about faith and we think about belief. Like, what does it mean to have faith in Jesus? It means that we believe Jesus to be the Son of God and to be the person he said he was to be and to be fully God, fully man, full of grace and truth, to be the king, all that. Like, that's what we believe. That's what, like, well, that's our faith. That's what faith is. But James is getting after something so important here. Because he's saying that 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 belief isn't enough. This is weird. But but really what he's saying, what he's begging us to ask, is what is faith? Have you ever asked that question? Like sometimes we just have words that are so common to us that we just like we use them, but we never really thought about like what does it actually mean? And that's what James is getting after. So we're gonna be wrestling with that question. Today and, and he gives us an illustration of what faith doesn't look like. And so he says, you know, James, he's a good, good preacher, dude. So he, he gives us an illustration, something to paint a picture. He's like, hey, let's just say one of you were out and about. You were out and about, you know, you're out and about. Uh, that was a moment where I tried to give you a little bit of a moment. Okay. Um, we're, we're out and about and we see someone who's in need. They ain't got enough clothes. Like maybe it's cold and they ain't got enough, right? Uh, or maybe they're, they just look hungry. You know, you've been out and about. You've, you've seen those moments where someone is in need. Maybe they're on the corner, uh, downtown at some kind of city or, or whatever. And, and they they have a sign that say, Hey, I, I need something. And a lot of us are skeptical. Right? Because we know that there are plenty of people who just do that and, and they don't actually need it, but they choose not to work and they choose that to do, to do that. And so a lot of us are skeptical and, and that's definitely a thing. There's a reason to be skeptical. But at the same time, there are a lot of people also in need and who are glossed over and maybe we, we're just like, man, I hope they do better. Right? Like what James is saying is it's possible to have genuine concern in your heart for someone who's in need. And be like, you know, I really hope that they can get stuff, you know, figured out. Maybe they can find a job or they can, they can get uh, what they need. They can get some clothes. Maybe they can get some food. Like, I hope they can do that, right? Like, I don't have enough time to help or whatever my thing is. Um, and, and James is saying, like, even if you were genuinely concerned in your heart for that person, and you say, hey, go and, 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 and go in peace and be warm and well fed. Like, you really mean it. It means nothing. You did no good with that. That was a failure. That was a a sign that your faith has no works. And your faith then is dead by itself. And so James is really showing us that like there's there's a an activity that is required in our faith. That that if we see someone's in need and we do nothing, that we're not putting to practice following Jesus. Why? Because Jesus didn't just look at all of us and say, oh, look at them. I, I hope they figure it out one day. You know, like, I hope they eventually stop tripping over themselves. That's what we all do. I hope they kind of figure out the sin thing. Hopefully figure out a way to, you know, pay for their sins. He, he didn't do that, right? He didn't just like, hey, I hope you go in peace and be warm and well fed. In the name of the Father, myself, and the Holy Spirit, you know? <laughs> that was good. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but he actually decided to come down to rescue us, right? He came down to actually help us. To heal those who are hurting. To be a presence with those who are who are uh, downcast. He, he came to put all of our sin and our shame and our guilt on himself on the cross so that we would be 
uh, taken out of our chains, our shackles to sin and death, and we would be able to be set free so that we could follow him. Like, that's what Jesus did, right? He didn't just say, hey, I hope all things go well for you, uh, but he came and he did something about it, right? And so if you are a Christian, then that means you follow Jesus, and if we, if our faith doesn't help us follow Jesus, if, I, if we just say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but we don't follow Jesus, then, my friend, I'm not a Christian. And that's what James is getting after. And it's like, he's just, he's just telling us like it is. This is what Jesus said. Uh, anytime, like, you know, he's out and he's healing people, he's like doing some really cool stuff, and people are like, y'all, y'all going to the, to the thing down at Kehoe because Jesus is going to be there. Like, he's going to heal some people and he's going to teach some stuff. It's going to be some crazy stuff. Like, you're going to go? Like, it's free admission. By the way, y'all got a, we got a worship night tonight uh, at, at Kehoe. Um, but, but, and Jesus will be there in present. But anyway, uh, people were following him. There's a big crowd following after him. And Jesus, in those moments where there was a big crowd, he would turn to them and say something that would cause them, many of them, to leave. Because <laughs> he wasn't like uh, just blinded by the numbers and like, oh, wow, look at this whole crowd. Like, I must be doing something right. No, he would say, hey, uh, if y'all want to follow me, if you really do, <laughs> um, you need to do this. This is what it looks like. To deny yourself. That means you don't indulge in every desire you've got. <laughs> uh, to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. And then people were like, did y'all hear what he just said? Okay, deny yourself. Okay, like I can get that. That sounds like really, you know, religious and stuff. But but pick up my cross. These people were used to walking down the street, smelling rotting corpses on Roman crosses. So they knew what a what a cross was, y'all. They they knew the stench of it. They knew what it meant. So Jesus, is like, hey, y'all, you want to come after me? This this fun. Anyone's welcome. If anyone wants to come after me, you're welcome. But this is what you're called to do. Deny yourself, pick up that instrument of death, and follow after me every single day. And people, understandably, they would walk away. Because who wants to be part of that? But that's, that's what Jesus called us to do. And so faith, real faith, follows. Real faith follows. It's not just like something that you believe in your head. It's like, oh yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus was like a real, a real dude, a real God dude, you know, like fully man, fully God. And he came and like, he even died on the cross. He rose from the grave. I even believe that. I believe that. That's, that's like, that's, I, I see it. I see the evidence. James is saying, um, that's not faith. That's not saving faith. That's not what he's saying. And he asks the question, right? In verse 14, can such faith save him? The implication of that question, the, the implied answer is, is no. No. And so he goes on, verse 18. He says this. Uh, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one. Good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Like, hey, you, you got the faith, I got the works, you know, it's a two for one special, but you know, I got the one, you got the other, we can put it together and maybe we got this thing. But James is saying, no, it's not one or the other. It's like faith and works are a Siamese twin. They ain't separated. Like, it ain't possible. You got to be together. You get that? They're together. Faith and works together. But did you notice what he said? The second part. It should kind of make us uncomfortable. Uh, he said, you believe that God is one, which, by the way, was like a, a foundational Jewish statement of faith about God, about Yahweh, about the God of the universe. Because they were surrounded by a culture of people who um, did not believe in just one God. They believed in many gods, polytheism. So so the, the God of Yahweh, the God of Israel, was their their belief that there was just one God. That was very much countercultural in their day. From the beginning, like... They have gods for everything. Gods for fertility, gods for uh, the wind and the rain and, you know, earth, wind and fire, like whatever. Like, God, God's for everything. And what he's saying, what James is saying, hey, you can even have this right, that God is one, that there's one God. 
You can have that foundational theological statement of faith in your life. And, and this is what he says about it. You believe that God is one. Good. That's a, hey, get your gold star, man. Even the demons believe. And they shudder. Even the demons believe. Even the demons have that kind of level of orthodoxy. Y'all, the demons, they, they've got, they have good theology. They don't have good, uh, big word, good big, uh, they don't have good orthopraxy. So they have an orthodox theology, but they don't have good orthopraxy. Right, right practice. They, they don't, they don't actually follow it. But they have good theology. Like they know the Bible more than all of us. They, they know it. So the question that James is like begging us to answer or ask, really ask ourselves, is how is my faith (laughs) different from a demon's faith? How is my faith any different from a demon's faith? And y'all, like, you just have to know, like, a demon's faith ain't something you want to have. You don't want to like, yeah, God is almighty, all powerful. He's, he can destroy me. He's probably going to do it anyway, but I'm going to choose to rebel against him anyway. I can know the truth about what he's trying to do. And yet I can still desire to find power, uh, in my own self. I can try and acquire it. I can try and fight against him that he's saying like, that's what the demons do. Don't do that. Like that, that's not a good, that's not a good thing. To have just a faith that you know the truth, but you don't do anything with it. That's what the demons do. They do the exact opposite. And so the question is like, how is my faith different from a demon's faith? When I was a teenager, you know, I've told you this story many times. Um, you're getting sick of it, maybe, but it's my story. So it's like, it's like I, what I got, you know? Um, I'm a teenager and I'm, you know, pondering my existence at night. I'm laying in bed and I'm just thinking about. Well, you know, I live 80 years, 90 years, maybe. I don't know. Um, Maybe more. Who knows? But, like, I die, and then what? That's just, like, then we cease to exist. Like, have you ever thought about this? Like, really, it hurts your head. It's kind of like, well, what's the point? And then we think about, like, where did we all come from? Like, why is this even here? Why do we even have this? Whatever this is. And I'm thinking about that, and, like, it makes sense to me that there is a God out there somehow, some way, like, I don't know what he's like, but there's got to be a dude in charge. That's just what I thought, right? And so I would pray at night. I didn't know who I was praying to, but I would pray. Like, God, you know, hey, thanks for this, I guess. What is what is this? And I'd pray every night. And I wouldn't talk to anybody about that. I don't think anybody close to me knew I prayed every night. I didn't even know why I did it. But let me ask this question. I believed in God. Was I saved? You can, you can say, no, I was not. No, I was not. I believed. I like you even think about Jesus. Like, uh, I, I don't know. Like, probably was a good dude. Sure. Was I saved? No, I was not. And so what James is getting after is like, there's more to faith than just mentally believing something is true. And so he goes on. He says this, James Two, verse 20. <laughs> He's so nice. Senseless person. Senseless person. Empty minded, like you're an airhead. <laughs> uh, our, <laughs> senseless person. Uh, so nice. Uh, I don't think he was in charge of pastoral care. I'm just saying. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, you don't want James coming uh, to visit you in the hospital. I just don't think it would go well. Uh, senseless person. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? He says it for a third time. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works and offering Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works. You see that? You see, see what he just said? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute? Homegirl can't get away from her past. You know, this is her nickname. Rahab the prostitute also justified by works and receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route. 
For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Cool. So he's saying that faith without works is useless, it's empty, it's it's counts for nothing. And he gives us a couple of examples of useful faith. Not useless faith. So he's talking about Abraham and I and and Isaac. And so uh if you if you know the story of Abraham, this is basically where it goes. Uh God uh told Abraham and his wife Sarah, like they were older, they you know, they're in nineties or a hundred, you know, that kind of thing. Um they're past their prime, let's just say that. Uh uh you know, they they weren't thinking about uh going and setting up a nursery in their in their crib, you know, in their house. That that's not what was on their mind. And so God comes to them and says, hey, uh, Abraham, Sarah, hey, uh, how's it going? You know, I hope it's going well. I'm going to uh, bless you, and I'm going to make a great nation through you. Um, and, and so your descendants, if you look at the stars, he's like, hey, go outside, look at the stars. There's a, there's a no light pollution, so you can see all the stars, and no clouds. And he says, hey, look at the stars. And he's like, wow, that's a lot of stars. Uh, your your descendants will number the stars. It would be, be crazy. And, he, and Abraham, right, like this old guy, uh, past his prime, uh, Sarah, past the prime, are promised by God that, that he's going to give them a son. And then through that son, they're, they're going to have this amazing uh, descendants uh, that is going to be made into a whole nation. And through their offspring, the whole world will be blessed through their offspring. And so, like, Abraham and Sarah, like, you have to imagine, like, that's, that's kind of a, you got to wrestle with that a little bit. Like, do I believe God? Do I, do I not? And so, like, time goes on. Um, they get impatient. Sarah was like, hey, I got this, I got this, uh, you know, employee over here, this girl, why don't you just make the baby with her? And Abraham just wasn't like on his game that day because he was like, oh, you, do you want me to do that? You want me to sleep with her? Okay. And he went and did that. And no, y'all, don't do that, okay? Don't get impatient with God's timing. Uh, uh, yeah. Fellas, that was a trap, okay? Uh, that was supposed to be a joke. I'm trying to lighten the mood here. Uh, you got moments, okay? Uh, and so they, they have that happen. Uh, got a, a, a child out of wedlock and, and just didn't work out for them. Just not, not good. And then eventually uh, Abraham and Sarah have Isaac. And so this is the promised kid. And God one day is like, hey, Abraham, Abe, homie, uh, can you take Isaac and, and take him up to this mountain? I want you to sacrifice him to me. Uh, God, like this is this is the one, this is the kid. This was the one that you said you were going to do this stuff through. You want me to sacrifice him? I'm going to kill my kid. And Abraham's like, okay. And they walk up, and they and he's getting ready to do it. I, I, this is this is a story that's really hard to comprehend in scripture. It makes me uncomfortable. I don't like talking about it, but. James talked about it, so I gotta talk about it because it's like what I do. But, uh, so, so he's up there and he's about to do it and then God stops him. He's like, hey, don't do that. And I got a ram over here, but God could see that he was gonna do it. And so Abraham believed God and, and that faith turned into works and he was gonna be faithful to what God said to do. That, that was a faith that worked, right? And then it makes us uncomfortable, like that story just, but like, Aren't we so glad that, that God, uh, the Heavenly Father, when He sent the Son down, uh, to be the sacrifice for us, that He didn't stop the sacrifice from happening? Uh, because, you know, the Isaac thing, Abraham and Isaac thing was a foreshadowing of what was to come because God was gonna say, you know what, I am gonna take it to that fullest extent and I'm gonna sacrifice my Son for you so that you could be free and have life. That's a moment to be like, yeah, that's good, yeah, amen. Uh, I know we've been in COVID, but y'all can respond. Uh, that, that, aren't we so glad, right? Like, aren't we so glad that that happened? This would be a good time to say yes. Um, but, but then he, he also gives another example. It's like Rahab, the prostitute. Uh, she wasn't living the life God would want for her, but somehow, in some way, uh, God spoke to her and, and encouraged her to take these spies, these foreign spies, who were trying to destroy her, her city, um, and took them in and allowed them to hide there and then sent them uh, on their way in a way that allowed them to, to escape uh, the, her own people's army and all that. And literally, like, her, her faithfulness to God in that moment saved her and her entire family uh, from destruction. 
And then, like, she joined the family of Israel by marrying into the family of Israel. Uh, and she's counted as one of the descendants of Jesus. Because she heard God and followed what God said. And so, like, it's not a bad idea, y'all. It's a really good idea when, when God gives you a word. It gives you something to follow, like to follow. And he's got some stuff in here for us. And so he gives those two examples of useful faith, like faith that actually moves, faith that works. And he bookends it again. He says, for just as a body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. I think he wants us to remember that. (laughs) I, I think he's repeated it four times and he wants us to get it through our heads that, that faith is not just believing something to be true. Like maybe you've been in church your whole life and the reason you've been in your life in, in the church your whole life is because that's like what you did. And you like believe the stories to be true. Like you believe what God has said to be true, but you're like, is this all that Christianity is? And maybe the reason that this, you think that is like all that Christianity is because you've not really surrendered to him. It's, it's possible to go through week in and week out, attend a worship gathering like this and still be far from God. Even if you believe that he exists. This is what James is saying, that there's a thing, that there are people who believe and at the same time are unsaved. And so what is faith? Is faith merely belief? No, it's more than that. Faith follows and faith is something that should be capturing our whole essence. See, remember back in the day, I go rewind again. Um, back in show and tell, y'all do show and tell? Yeah, okay, cool. So you like, you know, you get something you're really excited about and you bring it to school. And, and you had to, to show it. And tell about it, right? That was kind of the, the whole idea. Like the whole game, the rules of it are right there. Show and tell. You know, like some of you, I don't know if you've tried to bring a snake. Maybe your teacher didn't let you or whatever. But you're supposed to bring something you're pumped about and show and tell about it. I have to show you and tell you about it. It's not just tell you about it. It's not just use some words to describe it. It's like, I'm going to show you this and I'm going to tell you this. Aren't we so glad that when God decided, uh, he's always loved us, but when he decided to do something about it, aren't we so glad that he didn't just tell us, hey, I hope, hope everything goes well, I love you. But he actually showed us his love for us. Right? Like, I, I, we need to remember that James is, is telling us all this because we worship a God who loves us and cares for us and wants what's best for us. And when we have a faith that works, that actually follows Jesus, then that is us stepping into the best possible uh, circumstances for our lives. When we actually follow him, aren't we so glad that God didn't just say, I love you, but he showed us by sending his son so that his son could take on all of our sin, all the stuff that causes us guilt and grief and shame, all of that and take it on himself so that he could deal with it. He could deal with the penalty of it and give us an opportunity to be free from it. Aren't we so glad that he didn't just tell us about it, right? Mm, uh, yeah. Mm. I'll take that as an amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo! That's what I'll take that as. <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm, that's good. Uh, yeah. Show and tell. See, Jesus didn't just say it. He showed it. And this is what real faith is. Real faith isn't mere belief. It is allegiance. Real faith isn't merely belief. It is allegiance. We know this word. Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, United States of America, to the republic for which it stands. We we know that word in the context of that pledge, right? This is faith. Faith isn't merely just believing what Scripture says is true. It's having your full allegiance with King Jesus. It's saying, uh, I am for you, Jesus, before anything else. My allegiance to you dwarfs my allegiance to anything else in this world. That's what faith is. 
Faith requires us to have our whole will, our whole lives, our whole uh, desires, all of that. All of our decisions are shaped by Jesus. All of our all of our beliefs are shaped by Jesus. All of the ways we love are shaped by Jesus. All the things we do are shaped by Jesus. All the things we don't do are shaped by Jesus. Why? Because we have our allegiance, our devotion, our trust, our faith is with him. And when our faith is with him, then that means that we follow him. That we don't follow ourselves. Because that's a bad path. For any of you who have ever tried to do that, it ain't working out. It ain't. It didn't work. And for many of you, that's why you're here. And James wants us to, to just see that taking our faith seriously, having it be more than just what we believe, is so important for our lives. It's so important for this world to see that the object of our faith, he's alive. Because if we say that we believe... And we don't live, we don't follow him. Then all it is is a statement of an idea. We've not actually put it into practice. And if Jesus is alive, and if the Holy Spirit has been given to us to indwell us, to change us and transform us, then friends, there should be always times when we are working out our faith. Sometimes it's by us doing good. Sometimes it's by us letting go of the things that are bad. But all the while, Jesus wants us to grow in him. And so if you've not been stretched lately by Jesus, are you listening to him? Are you following him? If you're following him, he's right there and you can, he'd be like, hey man, you know, watch out for that. And he's letting you know where to go because you're following him. That's what it looks like to follow him, is actually follow what he says, follow what he did. Follow what he does. What if we just actually did what he said? Like, this is, this is the essence of what Jesus told us to do. I just tried to adjust my glasses. I don't have any glasses on. That was funny. Um, here, God just gave you that moment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. Uh, where was I going? Okay, yeah, so discipleship. This is what Jesus said, right? He said, hey, all authority uh, on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All of it. It's all mine. I'm, I am in charge. You are not. Uh, Therefore, because of that, go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them, watch this church, teach them to obey everything I have commanded of you. Not to just teach you to believe everything I have commanded you, but to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I'll be with you. Always, to the very end of the age. That's what Jesus said. That's what discipleship is. Let's not get it twisted. God gives us grace and he calls us to obey. He calls us to actually follow him in our lives. And this is the, this is the reason some of us struggle so much. Because we've not obeyed him. We keep tripping over ourselves. We keep falling for the same thing. We're not shaped by his word and actually obeying what he says. We're missing it. So here at FCC, we have this thing that we call uh, core steps. And the question we all have to ask ourselves is, are you stepping where he's stepping? Are you stepping where he's stepping? Is he going over here or stepping there? Uh, if he's going over here, we're stepping there. Are you stepping with him? Are you able to be so close to him that he's kicking the dirt up and is getting on you? Are we following him? And so this is what we, what we believe uh, is, is a way for us to grow in our relationship with Jesus, grow in our allegiance to Jesus, grow in our, our trust in Jesus, our devotion to Jesus. Uh, the first thing is to read the Bible. Like, maybe you think that's a good idea. We are for that. And, like, we gloss over that. It's like, yeah, that's a good idea. We just don't do it. Hey, Mike. That was a real quiet moment. <laughs> So we are for reading the Bible. Why? Because we, when we read the Bible, we know that we're going to start praying more. We know we're going to start meditating on God's word more. We know that we're going to have God and what he says on our minds more when we read the Bible. The second thing is, join a community group. Like when we're in his word and we're, we know that, hey, uh, by the way, discipleship most recently, since the enlightenment, uh, has been focused on information transfer. Like, I have this information, I'm going to give it to you. Now that you have it, you're discipled. That's not how it works. That's not what Jesus would would say for us. Uh, the Enlightenment kind of messed us up. 
Okay, it was good in some ways, but it kind of messed us up too. Because he's talking about obedience. And also, it's not just for you and God. Like your relationship, your religion, your religious beliefs. It's not just for you and God, you and Jesus, like me and Jesus. In my prayer closet, that's it. And then when I go out into the world, it's just nothing else. No, he's, he's calling us to have full surrender in everything, every area of life. And for us to actually talk about it. So, read the Bible and join a community group. Why? Because we're better together. We need people. And by the way, I've been working this out most recently, uh, talking to my counselor and to Sarah. Um, I believe that we're better together. I believe that with all my heart. But believing is not the most important thing. Actually, living as if it's true. Because you know what? I'm going to just be real transparent with y'all. Um, I don't want to need people. Because people have let me down too many times. I don't want to be dependent on someone else. I don't. I don't want to need people in my life. It's fine, you know, like we can like chill, hang out, it's fine. But for me to be able to like be super vulnerable and, and, and actually step into a place of intimacy, I don't... I, because that means we're giving our heart out to someone else and, and you get to decide whether you take that and you smash it or you care for it. Now, I don't know if I'm the only one in here who's like that, but that's because of some... Years of stuff. And and I believe wholeheartedly we're, we're better together. But y'all, it takes for us all to be Christ-centered and to be convicted that, that even whether or, not we be, whether or not we want it to be true, we believe it to be true and we act as if it is true because God has said it is. And so um, relationships are hard for me. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not important, right? So I have to work out that too. Um, my faith has to have work, so I have to step into it. So join a community group. <laughs> it's important whether you think it is or not, whether you uh, uh, are comfortable with it or not. So if you are someone who's like uncomfortable with opening up to someone else um, because you've had some pain, I get it. But let that not... Allow us, let's fight against the idea of growing bitter in our heart toward people because we've been hurt in the past. We need each other. Serve on a ministry team. It's important for us to have our faith go out from just ourselves and our head and our space and go out and put it on someone else. How can we be concerned about the other? That is what God calls us to do, to love God and to love others as we love ourselves. It's a perfect relationship kind of dynamic where we love ourselves and we love others as we love ourselves and we love God all throughout it. To serve on a ministry team. Like there's so many ministry teams that you could be a part of and I pray that you will decide that you want to step up and and serve one, attend one, be a part of what God's doing here, to be a part of it. Practice generosity. That is, you know, one thing that's really hard for a lot of us, you know, because it's my money and I need it now and I don't ever feel like I got enough, but you want to me to give it to somebody else. Cool. God teaches us that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So when we practice generosity, we're becoming more like Jesus because he was more, the most generous because he gave his whole life for you and for me. And God himself, everything that we have, is a gift to us and we get to steward it because it's all his anyway. And to help others take core steps. Oh, man. And you, by the way, you don't have to get through all four, the first four, before you start doing the fifth. Like, you can just, as you go, I started reading my Bible. Hey, I'm going to help somebody else read the Bible. I'm going to help others take a core step. I ain't got it all figured out, but we can read it together. Hey, you want to do this Bible reading plan together? Cool. Like, I'll text you. We can talk about it or whatever. We can get together for coffee, whatever. Um, join a community group. You're in a community group? Help somebody else join a community group. It's cool. You see, like, it's kind of cyclical. Uh, serve on a ministry team, help others serve on a ministry team. Hey, you would be great at that. Practice generosity, help others practice generosity. Hey, this is how God's uh, met us in the midst of our uh, wrestling with him on trying to be generous, even though we don't see how all the math is going to work out. And you can help others take generosity steps as well. 
Uh, that's what discipleship is, friends. We're all called to make disciples, all of us, every single one of us. Faith is not just belief, but it's making that faith move and living in light of what we believe every single day. So I hope, hope that all of us will wrestle with what uh, God has said through James and really wrestle with, uh, is my faith different from a demon's faith? <laughs> uh, am I stepping where Jesus would want me to step? And, and this is not to sprinkle shame on you or great uh, guilt, but it's to remind us of the grace that God's given us and how if we've been transformed by Jesus, then this is what it looks like, is to take our faith and move it to works. Church, would you stand? Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we, we thank you for being a good father, um, for always... Seeing us when we feel unseen. Always stepping in when we feel like we've got no one helping. For being the one who sometimes pulls us, pushes us, lovingly puts your arm around us when we just don't want to move. God, uh, maybe some of us in this room watching online... Uh, maybe some of us are in the middle of a season where we've just been struggling to to really sense the truth of what we believe, to sense your presence with us, to, to sense your leading. And some of us are dealing with some really uh, difficult decisions in front of us. Some of us are dealing with some hardships, some suffering. And God, we need you. We need you to show up. We need you to remind us of your grace, remind us of your presence with us. And, and God, we need direction. And we also need, this. we're, we're so dependent on you, God. We, we need not only direction, but we need uh, you to humble us enough to where we're willing to follow you in that direction. Um, God, please be the one who can get through all of our objections, all of our barriers that we've put up. Help us to see that you see us as a beloved child, a beloved son, a beloved daughter, who you love radically. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for giving us hope. We pray, God, that as we have faith, you would help us in that to continue following you, to continue having our allegiance with you. We love you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.